Hello everyone. This video lecture is going to deal primarily with the chapter that begins from page 49 to page 55, wherein we meet Audrey uh, as a young child in her father's laboratory. We're going to begin with a few discussion questions that are going to allow you to familiarize yourself with the approach to analyzing this text. As a lead up to the interactive class that we're going to have, and also to the Come Thou Toward Its section analysis assignment that we're going to be completing in class in a few weeks. We'll talk more about that when the time comes. However, in essence, you're simply going to be in your small groups analyzing and presenting on a small subsection of the text that will be assigned to you. It's not going to be an overly formal assessment, but the same kind of techniques and close reading strategies that we employ in this video and that I start to model for you are going to be the basis of your approach to that assignment. The kinds of questions that I'm asking you, highlighting key details, asking you questions to get you to think about characters, their motivations, how they relate to each other, what they want and why, and the implications of what's going on behind the scenes or underneath the surface of their interactions, what's being implied by their actions about who they are and what they want, are a way for us to better understand and approach the work, the kind of model for the approach that you'll be taking and the kinds of questions that you have to think to ask yourself when you're reading critically, when you're thinking about the text and not simply allowing it to pass you by. One of the key approaches to analyzing literature is actively asking questions about what, what's going on at any given moment. We can simply absorb the activities of characters. We can let them pass us by. We can note that there is language being used, but it's incumbent upon us, it's our responsibility as we're reading in order to understand the work to start asking questions about why this particular phrase? Why does this image stand out? What might this image mean? How do people respond to it? If there's a description of setting or a character's actions that's presented to us in great detail, why is the author choosing to highlight this particular detail? Or why is he or she focusing on it? These are the kinds of questions on the most basic level that allow us to begin to penetrate into the text and understand what is being said and how, rather than just recognizing the objective actions that transpire within the text. So these kinds of more generalized questions and the more targeted questions we're going to be dealing with both help you to start learning an approach to the text. How do I approach the text and begin to pose questions about it? How do I analyze it and read it carefully rather than just skimming it for meaning or reading it for meaning about the literal details? What's going on underneath the surface? So as an approach to that style of reading, I'm going to ask you to analyze this chapter. Pause the video after I'm done explaining this activity and take about 15 minutes to read that chapter, reread it carefully, highlighting and making notes. And then I'll do the same thing by way of a kind of interactive brainstorming session where I look at the text, read sections, and start to make observations about it and show you how I'm thinking about the text. Basically, what I'm doing is modeling an approach to reading. What I'd like you to do is reread pages 49 to 55 and then perform a close reading of the section. In other words, just start reading it carefully, noting details uh, about characters' interactions, strange word choices, images that stand out and what they could mean or what they make you feel and why. Anything that stands out in the text. Highlighting specific details that seem important. Wordplay, images, actions that may not make sense. If a character does something and you ask yourself, well, why? What's going on? Why did they make that choice or that decision? That's probably a moment to pause and start to think, to try to answer that question. Don't just let the question pass you by unanalyzed or unconsidered. Examine it. Think about it. Try to put in that question into conversation with other parts of the text to better understand what's going on. That's the process of close reading, noticing details inside the work. Then, Pick out specific lines that provide you with insight to the relationship between Walter and his daughter. How does Walter view her and treat her? What motivates him? Do they have a healthy relationship? Why or why not? So again, look for those specific details about their interactions, their relationships, their feelings towards each other, and what's going on. And then make a value judgment. Obviously, in an essay, you can't say, well, I think that they have a negative relationship. But you can say, ah, uh, there are clear signs that they have a negative relationship or a positive relationship, as the case may be, for X or Y reason, for specific reasons, based on these details that the author impregnates the text with. 
That is how we build analysis. We note things about the text, we note interactions, we note word choices, and then we begin to unpack them, not in terms of what we think or what we believe, but what is being implied by the text. The author makes allows us to make inferences about what's going on in the story by presenting us with these significant details, with these finer points. And next, Audrey stays on topic longer than is usual for her as she reflects on the distance between a mouse and a person in Walter's mind on page 51. What do you think this passage means? What's going on here? It's a strange passage. It's one of those typically uh, obscure or opaque uh, moments wherein Audrey is philosophizing or engaging in her unusual process of thinking. How does it reflect on Audrey's view of her father's relationship with his laboratory animals and with her? Take about 15 minutes, pause the video, and try to answer these questions by way of close reading. Don't just try to answer them, but actually reopen the novel, reread the chapter, go through it point by point, line by line, and start thinking about it, highlighting those details. Go through that struggle. Don't give up. Force the text to surrender itself to you by way of this approach of close reading. And then, as I've done in the past, breaking down the story, I'll go through my own uh, reading process and the, uh, the techniques that I would use and the observations that I make as I'm reading. Now, the first thing I notice is that the chapter here begins with assume life, my dad says, can go on indefinitely. As I start to think about this chapter, it's couched in this initial point about deaths not being inevitable. So already she thinks of her father in terms of life and death. The issue of life and death creeps into her recollections. I'm noticing that because of her current situation, what she recalls in this flashback is already couched in that central subject that dominates her current ruminations. From that, I recognize that chapter transitions are probably going to have more to do with the internal logic of Audrey's thoughts than with any kind of delineation between concepts within the novel. So it's not like an artificial boundary. The division between chapters and how we move into a new subject is actually a reflection of the way in which Audrey is thinking and the way in which current situations and circumstances influence her recollections of the past, what she chooses to remember, why, how, and when. In that light, look at how the previous paragraph ends. From behind, with the light streaming through, the tattoo on his ear says, 81. So she's looking at her mouse wedge and sees the tattoo, 81, stamped on her, his ear because he, as we learn in this next chapter, he was picked up from this laboratory. We see the origin story of her pet in the next chapter. So events in the broad, in broad terms, a reflection of her preoccupation about death and life, and also their reflection of her immediate concerns triggered by the interaction with Wedge. She sees the tag and she descends into memory. And yet, even as she picks up this clue or this external sign of the number 81, she's not able to understand its actual meaning. We learn in the next chapter that Wedge actually had the number 18 tattooed on his ear 20 years ago when Audrey first acquired him. So it's one of those clues that leads us to that conclusion that I mentioned in the first video lecture that actually this is not the same mouse. Of course, the mouse hasn't lived 24 years. The father has, as we learn, created this fiction, replacing the mouse year after year using a new version, a new mouse with the proper tattoo. But he got it wrong. He misread the tattoo with this one and stamped it with 81 rather than 18. So we see this little incongruity between the moment here and the recollections. The transition is a reflection of the way in which contemporary circumstances dictate our past, our, our, our recollection and construction of the past. As I said in that introductory lecture for this week, Audrey is remembering these specific events because they relate to and inform, they lead into the current situation that she's observing 
in the moment. So the past that's being constructed for us, what's being told to us, why, how, and how those things are framed from the very outset in that transition between chapters as a literary technique is an illustration of that central theme that I, re uh, that I referenced in the first video lecture, that ultimately our past is a construct influenced and shaped, given meaning and direction by our current needs and circumstances, as it is with Audrey, both in terms of that subject of life and death, and also the sight of Wedge and the mystery surrounding him that she doesn't even recognize that leads us into this flashback. Now, we gain insight into Audrey's characterization as both a child and as an adult in her interactions with her father. When the father says, he, you can assume that life goes on indefinitely, he's trying to distract her from the experiments that he's carrying out. As we learn on page 50, how does the force swimming test jog a cell's memory? It doesn't, he says. This is just a sidebar. We're just talking. There's no connection whatsoever, says my dad. Oh. So look at what's going on here as the two characters are interacting. Audrey Flowers is telling his daughter this story about the potential impacts of his research and the way in which through scientific progress, we may eventually be able to arrest the aging process and allow people to live indefinitely forever, barring accidents. He's doing this, he's approaching her this way and he's speaking this way for no apparent purpose, he says. It's just a sidebar. But the purpose of the sidebar is really to distract Audrey. We see that Audrey is looking at these mice and she says, in the water, their fur puffs up with worry. They're swimming or they're trying to climb out. They're trying to climb out. I do not see one mouse do the breaststroke or the butterfly or float about in the pool. They swim in circles, scratching at the sides of the pool. It's not really mouse vacation. It's a forced swim test. The pools are garbage cans from Canadian Tire, but don't tell the mice that. So already the connotations of this moment with the garbage cans creates this sense of refuse, of distress, and she fixates on the desperation of these creatures that are trying to escape from this infinite well that they cannot flee from. They're not strong enough. They're tiny. They're small. In her reflections on this moment, she initially tries to deny the reality of what's going on by couching something distressing, something disturbing in the best possible context. So Audrey, we see here, says it's a mouse vacation. Each mouse has its own pool. There are tw five pools, 20 mice. There are cages like hotel rooms stacked against the walls. So she sees this experiment that as we learn in that next paragraph causes her a great deal of distress. But in order to plaster over it, to conceal it with a veneer of positivity, she reframes it in her own mind subconsciously as a mouse vacation. She's trying to apply these positive connotations to a distressing circumstance in order to, to suppress her own negative feelings. She fails, and it's for that reason that her father continues talking to her. He's talking to her about something to distract her from the sight of this disturbing incident with the mice being half drowned in the forced swim test. So not only do we see Audrey's approach, her response to things that are psychologically distressing by ignoring them or trying to invent something to distract herself, we also see Audrey Flowers attempts to facilitate that defense mechanism by offering her something else to consider, something else to contemplate. Audrey's approach to this moment is like a microcosm. It's a picture in miniature. It's an example of what she does throughout the rest of the novel. When she's traveling home in the first chapter, she's constantly thinking about her tortoise. Should I go back? Is Winifred all right? Should I, can I escape from the pain of the reality of the inevitability of my father's death? That's what Uncle Toby tells her when she arrives and asks him, why didn't you tell me that my father was going to die? He says, I did tell you, you just weren't listening. And that's what Audrey does. She doesn't listen. She tries to block out these negative realities. And she's been trained to do it. She's been encouraged to do it, as it is here in this chapter, by her father. So we see how they relate to each other, their engagement, and how Walter Flowers has trained his daughter to react to negative stimuli, all bound up in just a few paragraphs 
in this moment. And we can create those kind of connections that give us insight into her failures of understanding. Not only does she have a low IQ, but she has never been trained to actually grapple with the realities of the horrors that she experiences around us. Not only on the surface level does Walter Flowers try to distract her from this reality, he also tries to convince her that the greatest horror of life, that the inevitability of loss and death isn't in fact inevitable. Assume life can go on indefinitely. So right here, we have multiple layers of characterization that inform Audrey's previous behaviors. They are the result of that transition from the previous paragraph or the previous chapter where she was thinking about uh, Wedge, how she got him, and her attempts to grapple with the death of her father leading into this memory, shaping that memory. So we can see here that there are a half dozen different elements of the characterization and evolution of themes carried out subtly under the surface if we pause to start thinking about how the characters are acting what we learn about them why they're doing what they are doing and how that influences previous interactions and how that frames them i should say now we have yet more evidence that the way in which audrey recalls the past in this moment is determined by the fixations and concerns of the adult narrating Audrey in this flashback. Even though it seems like we're viewing this through the perspective of the young girl herself in that moment, it's as if we've not flashed back, we've actually gone back directly to a prior moment and suddenly the child Audrey is narrating. It's really not. There's this strange interplay between the child Audrey and the current Audrey. It seems like the child Audrey is narrating, but in reality, it is the older Audrey reading things through her and telling things through her. So there's this strange narrative distance that we seem to have implied between us and the narrating older Audrey, but all of her concerns are read into, they are expressed through the child narrating Audrey. She fixates here on the reality of her father's death. That death impregnates those past recollections. Suddenly the details that she chooses to recall from her childhood are a reflection of those adult Audrey's concerns. Because as we move into that next section, there is a brain in the lab. It's present tense, even though it's in the past, right? This is the young narrating Audrey. So even though the young child Audrey is narrating the story, the fixation on well, the brain and the fact that her father has been knocked out of his geography, as the older narrating Audrey put it, he's suffered this catastrophic brain injury, comes to the forefront. There is a brain in the lab, a human brain. It sits on a shelf in a Tupperware container filled with formaldehyde. Now think about this. That is a person up there on that shelf. Who is that? What's his name? I have no earthly idea. Could you find out? My dad looks reluctant to find out. Can I name him? No. Can I hold him in my lap so long as I don't open the lid? Okay. Hello there, cauliflower brain, Mr. Cauliflower. You are so small and meaty, and yet you are also a person. I don't know if I can love you if you're not cute. Yes, I can. It makes no sense to me how small a brain is. So in this moment, the narrating Audrey reflects upon the reality that all that Walter Flowers was, was that small little sack of meat inside of his skull. And all of that is gone. The past is colored by events of the present. What she recalls here is really more of a reflection of the realization that her father through that catastrophic brain injury is gone. That expression of affection that seems so bizarre is not just typical Audrey oddities in the fact that she is so enamored with inanimate objects and animals, but it's also this deep concern about the person who is behind that brain that has been destroyed. We also see that Audrey becomes easily attached to inanimate objects and to minutia, to things that people don't actually consider. Walter Flowers, on the other hand, doesn't want to personalize or name that object. He doesn't want to humanize it. He doesn't want to think about the provenance, the origins of that brain and the fact that it used to be a human being. In the same way as he tries to deny the reality of death for his daughter, he wants to compartmentalize death, to hide from it, to relegate it to the darkness of ignorance. He doesn't want to think about the fact that it was once a person and that he is no different than that brain in a Tupperware jar. He's just a brain sitting inside of his own bony skull, suspended in liquid.
we then come to that central section of this chapter, wherein Audrey begins to contemplate the difference between human beings and mice. Inspired by the reflection on the physical reality of the brain, she starts trying to connect mice to human beings. The reason being that what Walter Flowers is saying about the experiments on mice and experiments into longevity is really his attempt to placate Audrey and to encourage her not to fear death and not to fear its inevitability. The connection she makes is between the mouse and herself. So there's this great winding pathway between animal and man. And we'll read through this passage together and I'll begin to unpack it and explore what Walter Flowers is trying to do and what she's trying to do through this reflection. Consider the distance between a mouse and a person in my dad's brain. It is very long. There are miles and miles of words between them. Just look at one of his articles. So, on the one hand, we have the distinction drawn between animals and human beings on the level of language, like we saw in the Island of Dr. Moreau. It's that capacity for speech and that ability to engage with language and even to play with language, as Audrey does, that for her defines something as animal or man. On the other hand, there's this extensive and pervasive distinction between animals and human beings in Walter's mind because there's this maze of words between them. That maze of words that appears in his articles is essentially the extrapolation from animal experimentation to human application. That's how we get from animal experimentation to human beings in the end. It's by way of not just experimentation on animals, but extrapolation and elaboration on those experiments to the application of these things potentially to human beings. You'll probably not see the word mouse, but the mice are in there. And so are the people. And the word mouse, cleverly disguised, eventually leads to the word person, also cleverly disguised. But the mouse never equals the person. My dad would not write the mouse hated swimming and longed to be back in his hotel room. Here, Audrey again suggests that she's capable of seeing connections between things that others do not. And in large part, she manufactures those connections to try to make sense of the world as she does here with the connections between mouse and human beings. She reads meaning into the articles that she can't really read because she can't understand them. She sees some of the words and recognizes some of them in her father's articles, but she doesn't understand them. And out of that lack of understanding comes an attempt to forge a substitute understanding of the world, of those articles, of the language that she doesn't really grapple with. Well, the father writes, I don't know what he would write, something about how much the subject drank afterwards in grams. Audrey looks at the human element. She connects the animal to the human being. Walter is perfectly and purely concerned with the objective measurement of things. He has a scientific empiricist perspective of the world based on things that can be measured or tested, weighed. Audrey has this inventive and creative perspective on the world that causes her to see the interrelationships between things that others don't. Her father becomes frustrated with this tendency, not the literal connection between mouse and human being, but Audrey's anthropomorphization of creatures and her ability to impregnate things with meanings that don't exist. My dad doesn't like it when I pretend a mouse equals a person or when a story does. For, those, for instance, those Beatrix Potter books that grandmother sent us had to be thrown out because of the way my dad's voice sounded while reading them. Beatrix Potter makes a mouse equal a person. She has a small, stupid brain, apparently. In Beatrix Potter's fiction, we have innumerable anthropomorphized animals, or animals that are endowed with the traits of human beings. So an animal that could like walk upright on its hind legs, an animal that could speak, or the like. One of her most famous works would be uh, The Tale of Peter Rabbit. So you may be familiar with Peter Rabbit from your own childhoods. This uh, book that was wildly successful as a kind of children's novel that featured a family of anthropomorphic rabbits, uh, including Cottontail and Peter, the youngest of these rabbit children, who uh, are, per are not permitted to enter into the vegetable garden of a farmer, Farmer McGregor. Peter Rabbit is this mischievous little creature. Uh, we don't need to really get into the details of this novel, but it's, uh, or this, these stories, but What's important here is how Walter Flowers responds to these tales of the anthropomorphization of animals. 
they had to throw out these texts, these stories, because of the way my father's voice sounded while he was reading them. Beatrice Potter makes a mouse equal a person. She has a stupid small brain, apparently. So Audrey, we gain by inference here, or we learn by inference, here's the contempt and the revulsion in the voice of Walter Flowers, because he finds these concepts of anthropomorphized animals and the tales of Peter Rabbit, these children's stories, so ridiculous, partially because he hates the idea of animals being endowed with this life, given that he is involved in animal experimentation. He finds it silly and ridiculous. He has, again, this very scientific rationalist view of the world that he compromises for Audrey by making allowances for her. But this is a step too far. That dismissive and negative tone that he adopts while reading it, he shows his contempt by the tone of voice that he has, forces them to stop reading these works. Because in a way, Audrey feels that being directed at her. She, like Beatrix Potter, is fascinated by these little imaginative stories about anthropomorphic animals. But Walter, in condemning or having that distaste and, and condemnation come through his reading of the stories, is also making her feel isolated and guilty for enjoying them. It's almost as if he's condemning her as being, as possessing a small and stupid brain. And that's why they have to do away with them. We also see that Audrey throughout this entire text has the exact same tendency. She anthropomorphizes Wedge, she invents a voice for him, she imagines that Winifred is talking to her, and she's right, Winifred is because she has the intelligence of a human being in this novel. She just can't actually speak to people. Now, there is of course an irony here, and there are innumerable ironies throughout the novel. Beatrix Potter was not just an author of children's fiction, she was also a natural scientist. In other words, somebody who studies nature and biology and also a conservationist. So there's this strange interplay as Beatrix Potter operates within this liminal space, this uh, space between Audrey and her father in terms of that anthropomorphization of animals and the more objective and scientific perspective on the world. And for some reason, Walter Flowers can't tolerate that and it's his um, dismissal of her that makes the reading of those stories so abhorrent to Audrey because she internalizes it and feels like it's an attack on her. Now we only read books about real people, true books that don't make my father's voice lie. So Audrey is obsessed with finding the truth of things, the reality of things. She hates it when her father lies to her, she says. However, we know from this entire section, that's all that he's doing to her. He's lying to her about the inevitability of death. Well, if it's not being inevitable, he's lying to her in a sense by distracting her from what's going on in reality around them. So everything about their relationship, although it is done out of love, is couched in a kind of deceptive manipulation. He's always infantilizing her and keeping her from the truth. And that reality seems to come to the forefront in her recollections about the books. Now we only read true stories things or true books that don't make my father's voice lie. But here is a secret about my dad's brain. Say you followed the path all the way from the word mouse to the word person. It is very long. Say you walked for days along that path. Finally, you reach person. But if you look beyond, you see that the path keeps going. It gets narrower and narrower until it's thin as a mouse's tail. And there at the very end, what do you find? You find the word Audrey. Assume life can go on definitely. Translation, yours. And that's kind of the linchpin to this entire section, that Walter Flowers is trying to convince Audrey that she doesn't have to die. Because as she looks on those mice struggling to breathe, struggling to survive, she begins to contemplate her own mortality. And recognizing that, seeing that distress and how Audrey is trying to deny it, as we already discussed, Walter tries to facilitate and to support that denial. Assume life can go on indefinitely not just for mice, not just in these experiments that really don't have anything to do with longevity, but for you as well. We also see Audrey's ability to further transmute negative experiences into positive ones by misunderstanding the superficial external signs of people's, or animals in this case's, reactions. She's unable to grapple with the horrifying reality or the truth of people's emotional experiences and instead applies something comforting in place of them. As she looks at the various different mice who are being brought out of the water and dried in a towel, 
She says, my dad is drying the mice on page 52. It is my job when he's finished to carry them back to their hotel rooms. They are damp and all a flutter, but I never scream or drop them. I put them back in the secure and secure the metal grids. Their pink heads press the glass. Their chests rattle. Dry me some more. They love being dried. My dad has a super soft, super absorbent towel that makes them go all dreamy and close their eyes. So what they're actually doing is being paralyzed by terror as they're manhandled. They're, they've just been traumatized and through this forced swimming test. And now after struggling to survive, treading water, minute after minute, being unable to escape, scrabbling at the sides, they're lifted out of the water and held in the clutches of a titan who starts squeezing and petting them. That's horror. That's terror. They've frozen in terror. But Audrey looks at that and sees a positive response. Their eyes are going all dreamy as if they're happy when it's the exact opposite. Now, Audrey then tries to rescue one of these mice that becomes Wedge, the pet that she has later on, although it's not really the same one as we learn. It's all part of Walter Flower's well-meaning continued attempts to uh, conceal death from Audrey. Um, she attempts to rescue him from the bucket in which he is undergoing the four swim test. I splash my arm into the water, but I'm not tall enough. Dad! Okay, he plunges his own arm in. I turn away. Is he alive? Don't look at him. So she can't see. She can't observe. She doesn't want to know. He's fine, Audrey. Look. So I look. Some very rapid mouse breathing, some very wide mouse eyes. Little frigger, my dad says. His sleeve is wet up to the shoulder. And so number 18 gets dried. So here we see that Walter is incredibly indulgent with his daughter, although earlier on he has no empathy whatsoever to the drowning mouse. He rescues it, not out of any kind of personal sentiment, but out of a tender feeling for his daughter. And then he continues to be incredibly uh, callous. So on page 54, I laugh. Obviously people do not eat mice. Then I stop laughing. What do giant people from Switzerland eat? Verlaine pats her stomach, no trace of a smile. No teaser, says my dad. Number 18 will be euthanized. Now she spells it euthanized on page 54, as in the mouse is going to go undergo this treatment in order to extend its lifespan. It's going to be rendered younger by way of Walter's experiments. Now obviously he can't actually do that, but she's misunderstanding a number of things. She doesn't understand what euthanasia actually entails. Now Verlaine looks at this thinking that she, Audrey is saying, actually, euthanized, put down. And she says, tilting her head in Audrey's direction, a chip of off, off the old block, no? So she recognizes in that moment just how callous Walter Flowers actually is. He feels nothing towards these animals because he's used to it. We also seem to get the sense that he is likewise inured to the suffering of others in large part. The only person that he shows any kind of sympathy towards at this juncture is Audrey, and he indulges her request to be allowed to euthanize, that is, render younger, Wedge, the mouse who failed the forced swim test. I want to do an experiment with number 18, Audrey says on page 55, my own experiment. I want to euthanize him myself. My dad says nothing for a moment, then he lifts his chin. Oh, Audrey. Like the frog who turned back into a tadpole. Why not? Why not? You don't understand. Yes, I do. We can't bring lab animals home every time. Verlaine wants a mouse sandwich. We can't bring lab animals home, period. I say nothing. I keep holding the door. My dad pretends to carry on, then looks over his shoulder. Comes back. Okay, tell me your experiment. So, Audrey obviously doesn't understand the reality of death, and instead of taking this moment to try to explain it to her, instead of actually helping her, helping her to grow beyond her limitations, Walter actually facilitates them. He keeps her ignorant out of a desire to protect her. So we can see the sort of complexities of their relationship at play here, and how all of these things, in terms of memory, grief, and loss, carry through the rest of the piece.